In this lecture, we're going to look at the arterial supply to the gastrointestinal tract. So we're going to look at the numerous arteries that supply nutrient-rich, oxygen-rich blood to the gastrointestinal tract, to the duodenum, the stomach, the colon, parts of the small intestine, and also to the accessory organs of digestion, like the pancreas and the liver. What we need to do is, first of all, imagine the gastrointestinal tract as one long, continuous tube, and we can divide it into foregut, midgut, and hindgut. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at the organs that make up the foregut and explain how they're supplied by the celiac trunk. We'll then look at the division between the foregut and the midgut, detail the midgut organs and how they're supplied by branches of the superior mesenteric artery. And then look at the organs that constitute the hindgut and how they're supplied by the inferior mesenteric artery. And then we'll look at some important transitions that occur between the foregut midgut and the midgut hindgut. So if we just look at this schematic first of all, then what I want to do is try and explain the aorta running parallel to the gastrointestinal tract. So this is the gastrointestinal tract all the way along here. This is the anterior aspect and this is the posterior aspect. Anterior aspect and the posterior aspect. So this view really is as if you were laying on your back and someone's looking at you from the side. What we can see is the diaphragm indicated here in green, the aorta passes through the diaphragm and at various points along the course, the celiac trunk is given off, the superior mesenteric artery is given off and the inferior mesenteric artery is given off. So at T12, at L1 and at L3, these vertebral levels, we have the celiac trunk or the superior mesenteric artery or the inferior mesenteric artery. If we then look to the gastrointestinal tract, we can see that the GI tract is split into foregut, midgut, and hindgut. Now, the separation between the foregut and the midgut, this occurs at the duodenum, specifically the major duodenal papilla. That separates the foregut from the midgut. And remember, the major duodenal papilla was halfway down the descending part of the duodenum. The midgut becomes the hindgut two-thirds of the way along the transverse colon. So two-thirds of the transverse colon is midgut, and then the remaining third is hindgut. And that's important when we look at which arteries supply which parts of the GI tract. So simply here in this diagram, we can see that the celiac trunk is going to give rise to branches that supply the foregut. We can see that the superior mesenteric artery is going to give rise to branches that supply the midgut. And finally, we can see that branches from the inferior mesenteric artery are going to supply the hindgut. These dotted lines here represent the transitions between the blood supply to the foregut and midgut. We saw this when we looked at the superior and inferior pancreatico-duodenal arteries at the head of the pancreas and the duodenum. Between the midgut and the hindgut, we had the transition that formed the marginal artery, inputs primarily from the middle colic and left colic artery, with the middle colic coming from the superior mesenteric and the left colic coming from the inferior mesenteric artery. So these foregut, midgut and hindgut regions have specific blood supply, but there's also a transitional area between them. So we're going to look at the specific branches from the celiac trunk, superior mesenteric artery, inferior mesenteric artery, and also consider those transitions. So here we can see a general, more anatomical drawing of the blood supply to the GI tract. We can see we've got the abdominal aorta up here. We can see it's passing down through the diaphragm. Remember, the aorta passes through the diaphragm, through the aortic hiatus at about T12, esophagus T10 and the inferior vena cava at T8. So the aorta passes down and then really we can pick it up again around about here where we have the celiac trunk 
pretty much immediately being given off. So the celiac trunk could be given off really at the lower border of T12. We can see that the celiac trunk has a number of branches. We can see a branch goes in this direction, and this direction, and this direction. Three branches that are going to go and supply the foregut. We can see we have the hepatic artery that's going towards the liver. We've got a gastric artery that is running up towards the stomach. And we can see we've got a splenic artery that's running towards the spleen. Coming off these blood vessels, we have smaller vessels that are going towards the pancreas. We can see the hepatic artery going towards the duodenum and going towards the head of the pancreas, all coming off the celiac trunk. If we were to look at the superior mesenteric artery here, superior mesenteric artery comes off at about L1. And we can see this is giving blood really that's passing to the jejunum and to the ileum. It also gives rise to a blood vessel that passes up to the pancreas and the duodenum, the inferior pancreatico-duodenal arteries. And we can see it's also giving rise to blood vessels that go to the cecum, ascending colon, and also to the transverse colon. We can see we have the inferior mesenteric artery. This originates from about L3, and this supplies blood to the hindgut. So we can see we have left colic arteries, sigmoidal arteries, and the superior rectal artery that passes to the rectum. We can then see these black circles, which are indicating the important transition. The transitions between the foregut and the midguts the pancreatico-duodenal arteries, and the transition between the midgut and the hindgut at the marginal artery here from the middle colic and the left colic. So this is a general scheme of how the gastrointestinal tract receives its arterial blood to carry out its vitally important function of providing oxygen so the tissues can work and nutrients to provide them with sufficient energy. So if we look at the foregut now in more detail, we can see that coming here, we've got the celiac trunk. The celiac trunk is going to give rise to left gastric artery here, and this will run along the lesser curvature of the stomach. We can also see that coming away from the celiac trunk is what's known as the common hepatic artery. And the common hepatic artery will give rise to a blood vessel which is called the gastroduodenal. We'll come back to that later on. And then once it's giving rise to the gastroduodenal, it then becomes the hepatic artery proper. And coming from the hepatic artery proper, we then find we have the right gastric. And the right gastric artery is going to anastomose with the left gastric artery around the lesser curvature of the stomach. Remember, we spoke about this briefly when we did the anatomy of the stomach in an earlier lecture. Running around this lesser curvature, we have the left gastric and the right gastric, forming this loop. Another branch that we haven't mentioned yet coming from the celiac trunk is this large splenic artery that runs to the spleen. This gives rise to some short gastric arteries that supply the fundus and the posterior body of the stomach. And as it approaches the um, hilum of the spleen, the splenic artery gives rise to this left gastroamental artery. The left gastroamental artery runs along the greater curvature of the stomach, and this is going to actually anastomose, form another anastomotic loop with the right gastroamental artery, and this gastroamental artery comes from the gastroduodenal that I mentioned. So we can see that the celiac trunk gives rise to two anastomotic rings of arteries that supply both the lesser curvature and the greater curvature. We can return to the vasculature of the liver and the celiac trunk giving rise to the hepatic artery, then the hepatic artery proper will ultimately then run up and supply the left and right hepatic arteries to the left and right functional lobes. We also have the cystic artery which comes typically from the right, and that runs to the gallbladder. If we then look on the other side of the screen, we can see the actual detail, which is the gastroduodenal artery bifurcating and giving rise to important blood vessels that supply the head of the pancreas and the duodenum. Here we can see the gastroduodenal artery. Now remember, the gastroduodenal artery would have given rise to a right gastromental, 
And then the gastroduodenal artery continues and it bifurcates into two. It bifurcates into two arteries, which are the anterior and posterior superior pancreatico duodenal arteries. We can see we've got a very short stem of superior pancreatico duodenal artery, which quickly goes into a posterior and an anterior that are passing inferiorly towards the head of the pancreas and to the duodenum. Now, these two blood vessels, your anterior and posterior superior pancreatico duodenal arteries, are going to anastomose with the equivalent branches, anterior and posterior branches, of the inferior pancreatico duodenal artery. And the inferior pancreatico duodenal artery comes from the superior mesenteric artery. So, here we can just about make out approximately where the major duodenal papilla would be located. We can see that everything in this direction is going to be foregut, and everything in this direction is going to be midgut. So this region is going to be supplied by the inferior pancreatico duodenal artery from the superior mesenteric artery, whereas everything in this direction is going to be supplied by the superior pancreatico duodenal artery. And this is a branch from the celiac trunk. And here we have this important transition, transition of blood between the foregut and the midgut. Here we just have a schematic which is going through the various branches that come from the celiac trunk that I've already spoken about. So we've seen the celiac trunk, that's coming at T12. That gives rise to three branches. It gives rise to the less gastric, the splenic, and the common hepatic. The left gastric may give rise to an esophageal branch that runs up and supplies the esophagus. We can see that the common hepatic the common hepatic artery, this is going to divide into the gastroduodenal artery, which we spoke about, and the hepatic artery proper. It's that hepatic artery proper that is going to supply the gallbladder via the cystic artery. It goes to supply the liver via the right and left hepatic arteries. And it gives rise to the right gastric. And it's the right gastric and the left gastric that run along the lesser curvature of the stomach the lesser curvature of the stomach. If we go to the gastroduodenal artery, we know the gastroduodenal artery gives rise to the superior pancreatico duodenal, which then has its anterior and its posterior branches that go anterior or posterior to the head of the pancreas and the duodenum. It also gives rise to the right gastroamental artery, and the right gastroamental artery is going to run along the greater curvature of the stomach, where it anastomoses with the left gastroamental artery. And we know the left gastroamental artery comes from the splenic. So we can see we have these anastomotic loops, two of them originating from the celiac trunk that go round the stomach. We have one left gastric, right gastric, hepatic artery proper, common hepatic, back to the celiac trunk. We then have a second, which is the splenic, left gastromental, right gastromental, gastroduodenal, common hepatic, celiac trunk. We have two anastomotic loops running around the stomach. Now let's move on to the superior mesenteric artery. The superior mesenteric artery supplying the midgut. The midgut going from the distal half of the duodenum, so all structures distal to the major duodenal papilla, and it includes the jejunum, the ileum, the cecum, the appendix, ascending colon, and the proximal two-thirds of the transverse colon. And we can see the superior mesenteric artery here, around about L1, is giving rise to a series of jejunal arteries and ileal arteries that pass within the mesentery towards the jejunum and the ileum. It carries on in this direction alongside the root of the mesentery and passes to the lower right quadrant. As it approaches the lower right quadrant, it then gives rise to iliocolic arteries, iliocolic arteries that go and supply the appendix, 
and also a right colic artery and a middle colic artery. The middle colic artery is important because that passes up and that contributes to this marginal artery which we'll come back to in a moment and that runs along the inside of the transverse colon and these colic arteries feed into it, the middle colic specifically. We also have the inferior pancreatico-duodenal artery and we spoke about that when we looked at the arterial supply to the foregut. So we've got superior mesenteric artery, gives branches to the jejunum, gives branches to the ileum. It gives branches to the ileocecal junction, so to the distal part of the ileum, to the cecum, and we'll also find an appendicular branch there as well. We then have a right colic artery, and we'll have a middle colic artery, and these will give branches to the marginal artery. And this runs along the inside, paralleling mostly the transverse colon, and then it drifts down, as we'll see, for the inferior mesenteric artery into the descending colon. And we've got the inferior pancreatico duodenal that we've spoken about. So the midgut extending from the distal half of the duodenum to the proximal two-thirds of the transverse colon, that stretch of the GI tract is supplied by superior mesenteric. The inferior mesenteric artery, this is the third unpaired artery that's coming off the aorta, the unpaired visceral branch that's coming from the aorta, comes away at about L3, inferior mesenteric artery, comes away at L3, and it supplies the distal third of the transverse colon, the distal third of the transverse colon, descending colon, sigmoid colon, and parts of the rectum. It does this by the left colic, which we can see passing towards the left, towards the descending colon. It also gives rise to a series, maybe three, four sigmoidal arteries, which go to supply the sigmoidal colon. And then it gives rise to a superior rectal artery. And this will be the one that's most continuous with the inferior mesenteric artery. As the inferior mesenteric artery comes down, the le initial left artery it gives off will be the left colic. The subsequent left arteries will be the sigmoidal artery, and the remaining one will be your superior rectal, which we can see here. These will be your sigmoidal, and then we've got your left colic. And what we can see is the left colic, and also to some extent the sigmoidal artery, are running towards the colon, where they meet essentially what is this quite large arcade, similar to what we had with the small intestine. And that arcade is being fed into via left colic and the middle colic coming from the superior mesenteric artery. So this stretch here is known as the marginal artery. A stretch of arterial blood that's running parallel along the inside of the colon and that helps to supply this transitional area between the midgut and the hindgut. Just before the bifurcation of the aorta into common iliacs, just superior to that, you have L3, where the inferior mesenteric artery is occurring. And at this location, it's quite common for atherosclerotic plaques to occur. And this can actually occlude the opening for the inferior mesenteric artery. The wall can be dissected. And this means that the inferior mesenteric artery can become occluded, and the hindgut would have a reduction in blood supply. But because of this marginal artery, and we have inputs from the superior mesenteric artery, it's actually possible for the blood to be diverted down in this direction towards the hindgut, which can then receive blood from the superior mesenteric artery. So this transition is really important. And this is just what we're focusing on towards the end, these two important transitions. Transitions between the foregut and the midgut, transitions between the midgut and the hindgut. And we can see that these can happen in a number of places, the superior and inferior pancreatico-duodenal arteries and the middle colic and left colic forming the marginal artery. And these are really, really quite important in maintaining a sufficient blood supply to the GI tract. So in conclusion, we've looked at the blood supply to the GI tract and also the accessory organs of digestion. And we've focused really on the foregut, midgut and hindgut and the branches of those respective arteries that 
go and supply the tissue. We've also looked at those important transitions. 